year after the National Economic Council NEC meeting chaired by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibaju directed state governors to establish judicial panels of inquiry to investigate complaints of police brutality and extrajudicial killings, the consensus is that government has failed to bring perpetrators of violence and killings to justice. On Law Weekly today, we look at how well the judicial panels fared. We also discuss the Child Rights Act and especially issues of the girl child. We chat with a senior legal practitioner, Mrs. Fumi Falano, plus a recap of some of the top trending legal stories. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Shola Shieli. Just like always, Nigeria joined the rest of the world this year to mark the International Day of the Girl Child, celebrated every October 11. This year, issues of access to the digital space, security, and the provision of basic amenities to help the girl child fulfill her potential continue to resonate. My guest, Mrs. Fumi Falano, is all too familiar with these issues. Mrs. Falano is one of the country's leading women rights activists. She currently serves as the National Director of the Women Empowerment and Legal Aid, a non-governmental organization which defends the rights of women and children. But first, here is our assessment of how well government handled the NSAS protest and the lessons one year after. The, the, the Nigerian youth, I want to tell you, cannot be happy with this situation. Even those of us that belong to, not to their generation, we are not happy. Because if the youth can voice out their dissatisfaction, it is the responsibility of the government to stand up and listen to what these youth have to say and make corrections. That is where we say the government is responsive. There is, a, the, there is the pretext that the SARS, has been uh, scrapped, but we still hear that so many activities are still under, are going underground. And this is not how government should run the affairs of the nation. I believe our leaders should be more sensitive, yes, to, and listen to what the people want. That is why they put them there. That is why we voted them there. And that is the essence of democracy. They would have forgotten that they, they, they canvassed for the vote of the people. In a few months' time, they will be asking us to come vote for them again. I only believe that people will use their head now when they have to vote again. Now, when they come back to ask us to vote, they should give us what they have done. Let them tell us how well they have been able to satisfy us. If we put you there, you are saying, I want to go there, I'm canvassing for your vote so that I can go and represent you. It is very sad that the government you voted to power descended on your children, the future of the country. They want to destroy their future because this youth, either they like it or not, the future is the future of the country. They're going to take over from them, either they like or from us. Either we like it or not. And so we should respect their views. We should therefore listen to what the youth have to say. The government has not done well at all. It's 32 years since countries across the world adopted the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. But how would you say that as a country we fared with issues concerning the Nigerian child? Not much has been done as to the rights of the gay child in Nigeria. And uh, I, I want to begin from home. Now, the, in the family, the gay child is seen as inferior to her brother. Talking about uh, access to education, in some parts of the country, even as of today, the gay child is expected to stay at home or to go learn a trade while the brother goes to school. And I'm sure you know this will eventually create a very wide gap between the education of women and men as they grow up. Then again, even a man and a woman in the house expect that when, when a woman gives birth to a girl, that means, oh, usually in this part of the world where we say, congratulations, you have uh, a child. Say, oh, a boy or a girl. They will say, a girl. Say, hmm. Oh, it's a boy. Oh, so that's again from the credo. You already sent the signal of unwanted, unrespected, inferior to the girl who is just coming to the world. 
and this she grows up with. And the girl is asked, go to the kitchen and cook. Your brother, go and play or go and watch television, go and play football. Why the girl? It is the duty of the girl to take care of the home, but it's not that of the man. So from there, she begins to develop this, uh, the, the mentality of inferiority and sees herself as being inferior. Then again, when they begin to go to school, in school, the gay child is also seen as not as good as the boy. And so all these go on to affect the, uh, the gay child psychologically and emotionally. Now, the, the essence of the International Day of the Gay Child is to create the awareness of the nations all over the world to the plight of the gay child. And of course, the plight include inequality in access to education, child marriage, child trafficking, domestic violence, which is very, very rampant, rape, uh, indecent assaults, uh, child uh, prostitution, hawking, and so many other things. Then again, we talk about violence in the society. The gay child is at the risk of um, rape. On the pages of newspaper, you hear stories of uh, a child being raped, uh, an underage being molested, even by sometimes by stepfathers, men in the home, even people quoted unquote uncles. And so these are things that again we need to also look at. The law of rape in Nigeria, the law guiding the prosecution of rape in Nigeria, really, well, of course, we do have the laws, but the, the procedure is so cumbersome that it has become increasingly difficult to get people uh, uh, prosecuted and, of course, convicted because of the so many uh, uh, technicalities involved. Of course, one of such that we have tried to campaign against and ask that should be expunged from the procedure is the fact that the, the rape gay, the victim, uh, uh, evidence must be corroborated. And you ask me, is it possible for somebody who wants to rape to call a third party to come and witness when it is not a dinner party that you invite people to come and witness? So most times we do not get people to corroborate the evidence of the, uh, uh, the victim. And again, from the time the girl is, uh, uh, becomes a victim, you need to also keep some things in place like the underpants and other things. These, of course, are usually also defeated. And so we don't get this uh, done. What would you say is the way around that? The way around that is to reduce the technicalities associated with the procedures in uh, the prosecution of rape cases. Is it by tinkering with the laws? Yes, not just the procedure. Yeah, the procedural laws, which also are developed over the years, can also be reformed. And this, we have been campaigning for this. Under the laws, we can reform this procedure. Let's talk about the Child Rights Act. We've been on this issue of domesticating the act for a long time now. What do you think that we should be doing differently? I, I think there are people in the States that can also go to court and compel them. This, again, is what we call judicial activism. I'm sure you remember there was a case. Uh, uh, we went to court to challenge the regulation uh, 124 of the Police Act. And the court went ahead to, to uh, uh, strike it down. And since then, it has become a law. You know, the beauty of legal profession is that the development of the law can be associated, can be done through judicial activism. And this is what we call a uh, judicial precedent. When a matter is taken to court and a decision is uh, uh, obtained on a particular issue, if it is a decision of a superior court, it becomes the position of the law on that issue. Now, for example, the case we took to court on regulation, because it was a decision of a superior court, it has since, the position now has since become the position of the law as of today. What does regulation one Regulation 124 states that the, a, a, a female police officer who desires to get married must take the permission of uh, her commander before she can get married within the first three years. But that, again, is not applicable 
to the Hamir counterpart. So we took it to court based on the right to freedom from discrimination. Section 42, which says that nobody shall be discriminated against in the society, in the place of work, even at home, anywhere in Nigeria, based on sex. And the courts held that, yes, that is a fact. This law is, of course, very discriminatory against women, and so it should, it should be expunged uh, from the law. And so since then, it has ceased to become part of the law. And there are so many other laws that often patently discriminate against women. Now you will ask me, what happens to a man that impregnates a woman within the first three years? Nothing happens. So all these are things that also show that the rights of women, of course, these are the rights of uh, the gay child, need also to get more attention and to be more respected. Yes, I, I, and I was talking about uh, child trafficking. Yes, this is again, it's one of the plights of the gay child. You will notice that in homes, and I want to bring this to the attention of young mothers, who are nursing mothers, who are working mothers, who take uh, house girls, domestic servants. It is against the law to take any girl that is below 18. It is an act of slavery and torture to take any girl that is below 18 to be a house help in your home or a domestic servant. Because that age, between the age of 6 and 18, is a school age. They should be in school. And so if your own children are in school and you bring a girl to be a servant, that's slavery. It is against the law. And so they can be prosecuted for that. As a matter of fact, the Child's Rights Act of Nigeria and the child's right law of Lagos State specifically prohibits that whoever is found is guilty of an aff offense and uh, can be liable to three years imprisonment. And it is the right of the child in Lagos State under the child's right law to freedom of education at least to JSS level. So any child that is found on the street during school hours should be taken away from the street and registered in school. Especially the gay child. Now that we are celebrating the International Day of the Gay Child, we must also bring the, uh, our attention to the plight of the gay child, especially their right to uh, equal access to uh, educational opportunities. You've said a lot to us about the discrimination that the girl child faces. But what can be done about the religious and cultural norms that enable this? It is the position of the law that any custom or religious belief that is inconsistent with the provision of the constitution is null and void. And so all we need to do is to begin to bring to, uh, uh, to the attention of the people and campaign against this discriminatory practices that are discriminatory under the constitution as well as uh, against the rights of the gay children. We should, there should be more campaign and enlightenment. I want you to know that most of these parents do this out of sheer ignorance because there is no religion that prohibits education. I was telling somebody this morning, no religion says that the girl is inferior to the boy. The boy child is sent to school, the girl child is asked to go and marry. There is nothing in any religion that says the girl child should not go to school. So we therefore should begin to enlighten them and campaign against these beliefs. And of course, like I said, one of the ways we can campaign against these beliefs is to take these practices to court. Go and test them in court. You have a right of a day in court. Go and test them in court. The beauty of our law is that our law, the development of the law can be gotten through judicial precedent. When you get to court, if a decision is made, it becomes the position of the law. There is a practice in the eastern part that was taken to court. Majeku and Ojeku. The practice was that a, a, a man that does not have a a boy, a man that does not have a male child, if he, if he desires a male child, can allow one of her female children to remain in her home, in his home, and begin to procreate for him. If he will now go out, 
get pregnant, it will be impregnated by another man, but bring the pregnancy home, and the baby will now be answering the name of the father. In other words, the baby will be that of the father, not of the biological father. And we went to court. The court said, no, it is repugnant to natural justice, and it is inconsistent with section 42 of the Constitution, and so it is null and void. And so that practice cannot stand in the face of the law and should be expunged. So these are areas we should look at and see how we can reform our society through judicial activism, how we can reform uh, our, our beliefs. Because I want to let you know that tradition and cultural practices are also dynamic. What you believe must move with time. And so as we progress, as we begin to also uh, get educated and awareness of our people is going up, we also must begin to change our beliefs. And that is why they, we need a lot of campaign and a lot of uh, activism to change the beliefs and the practices of uh, uh, parents, of the society against the gay child in the society. Welcome back. We turn our attention fully to the judicial panel set up in the aftermath of the NSAS protest and look at some of the recommendations from there. Why are we here? Why are we here? Are we the peaceful here? protest followed by the need to stay alive, sought an end to police brutality and reforms, crystallized in the hashtag NSAS. The young Nigerians had their demands, the five for five. And one of them was for the government to set up an independent body to oversee the investigation and prosecution of all reports of police misconduct. In compliance with the demand, the National Economic Council, NEC, chaired by Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo, recommended the establishment of judicial panels nationwide to address complaints of police brutality after the president dissolved the police SAS unit. 29 states and the FCT set up judicial panels of inquiry, which includes representatives of the youth, government and civil society, and almost 3,000 petitions were submitted across the state before these panels. A press release dated October the 15th, 2021 from the office of the vice president said that NEC had received reports from 28 states that established judicial panels. The release also said that 11 states had submitted their final reports, while Lagos, which recently concluded its sitting on Monday, October 18, 2021, had only submitted an interim report. The FCT panel on its part resumed sitting on the same Monday, October 18, after a break which lasted over six months. The panel has since adjourned to November 1st for lawyers to tidy up their final addresses prior to concluding its sitting. Concluded our work. In most of the states which submitted its report to government, key recommendations have been made for compensation to victims of police brutality and extrajudicial killings, some of which have been made Thank public. you very much. For example, in the southeast states, Abia recommended 511 million naira to be paid as compensation with about 46 petitions determined, while Imo recommended that 770 million naira be paid to victims as well as individual policemen who suffered losses. In the South South states, the Bielsa Judicial Panel awarded 21 billion naira against the police for extrajudicial killings in 40 petitions while the Edo panel recommended 288 million naira as compensation. Some other states, such as Akwaibom, were silent on their recommendations, and this has been condemned in the media. Only the southwest states of Ekiti and Lagos have paid out compensations to deserving petitioners. While Governor Kayode Fayemi paid over 7 million naira in its first tranche of compensation to 24 beneficiaries, the government promised to pay the remaining compensation of 13.8 million naira for 28 beneficiaries. 
Lagos State has paid out over 200 million naira as compensation and even awarded a total of 410 million as compensation to about 70 victims. In the North Central, the Benue State Judicial Panel asked the government to pay a sum of 304 million naira as compensation to victims, while Nasarawa recommended 480 million naira. In the Northwest, Kaduna and Katsina stood out as the only states that set up judicial panels, while the five other Northwest states refused to do so. Bono and Yobe in the Northeast did not also set up panels, but most of the other states which did failed to make public the figures recommended for compensation. At its October 15 meeting, NEC resolved that payment of compensation to victims should proceed in each state. It also resolved to ensure the prosecution of persons indicted by the various state panels. But despite these resolutions, there are still widespread agitations that government has not done enough to bring to justice perpetrators of violence and those alleged to have shot at peaceful protesters during the October 2020 NSAS protests. With many of the states yet to pay victims and prosecute culprits, this one-year anniversary of the protest should serve as a reminder for the states and the FCT to abide by the resolutions of the National Economic Council and meet one of the key demands of the protesting youth. And just before we go, let's bring you a recap of some of the top legal stories that made the headlines. We begin with the reports that the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu, has pleaded not guilty to the seven-count charge preferred against him by the federal government. Namdi Kanu is also challenging the jurisdiction of the federal high court to hear the suit on the grounds that the alleged offences were committed in the United Kingdom and not Nigeria. His rearrangement comes on the heels of the refusal of the Department of State Services to allow journalists into the courtroom to witness the trial. Justice Binta Nyako refused the application to transfer Kanu to the Kuje Correctional Center before adjourning to November the 10th to hear the pending applications. At the same court, Sheikh Ibrahim El Zakzaki and his wife are challenging the seizure of their international passports by the Department of State Services, DSS, and the Attorney General of the Federation. In their separate suits filed by Femi Falano Chambers on 14th of October, they told the court that their passports were last seen in the possession of the National Intelligence Agency, NIA, who have officially denied that the passports were in their possession. They said attempts to renew their passports through the Immigration Service revealed that it had been flagged by the DSS. According to them, all requests to remove the restriction have been ignored by the DSS. They are subsequently asking the courts to compel the DSS and the AGF to release their passports and lift the red flag restrictions. They are also asking to be paid the sum of 2 billion naira as general and exemplary damages for the violation of their rights to freedom of movement. Still in Abuja, the Supreme Court has declared Valentine Ozigbo the authentic the candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, for the November 6 governorship election in Anambra State. In the judgments, the panel of justices, led by Justice Iyang Okoro, threw out the suit challenging Ozigbo's candidacy and awarded the sum of 5 million naira as damages against Senator Ugochuku Uba. The panel also affirmed the decision of the Court of Appeal, Oka Division, delivered on September the 3rd, which declared Ozigbo the authentic governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party. In Lagos, the Sexual Offences Court sitting in Ikeja has watched the video of the 14-year-old girl allegedly defiled by Nollywood actor James Olaruwaju, popularly known as Babai Jesha. Justice Tony Yutai will also heard that the child was indeed defiled and suffered a ruptured vagina which has since healed. 
This testimony was given at the proceedings by a prosecution witness, a medical practitioner, Dr. Aneko Makonjola. The witness also stated under cross-examination that further examination of the child showed that prior to the incident, she was not sexually active. And we round off with the reports that the Legal Practitioners Privileges Committee has elevated 72 lawyers to the rank of Senior Advocates of Nigeria, SAN. The LPPC took the decision at its 149th plenary session held on Thursday, October the 21st, 2021 in Abuja. The rank is awarded as a mark of excellence to members of the legal profession who have distinguished themselves as advocates and academics. Some prominent names on the list include the Attorney General of Ikiti State, Wale Fakwunda, former member of the House of Representatives, Ehioge West Idahosa, a son of a Supreme Court Justice, Eko Ejembi Eko, and the Executive Secretary of the National Human Rights Commission, Tony Ojuku. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanku Muhammad, is expected to swear in the new silks at a ceremony to be held on December the 8th at the Supreme Court. The list is coming on the heels of concerns voiced by the body of senior advocates, Bosan, over the large number of applicants shortlisted for the award. And that's our program this week. Don't forget that you can find these and past episodes of the program on our YouTube page. I'm Shola Sheyele. Thank you for watching and see you next week.